Hello everyone! So as you know, your first project, a uh, big one for the quarter, is doing this copy of this Edward Hopper Second Story Sunlight. So I'm going to go through a couple of the things for it, things to look out for, and how I would create a couple of the textures using the blending methods from previous demo, okay? First we're going to mix some colors. You're going to need a lot of titanium white, that's why we had you get the big tube. I have this set of Arteza that I'm using because I think they're the closest to maybe the body of the acrylics that you will have. If you have a heavy body acrylic, just know you're going to have to work it in a little bit more. So this blue that I first mixed with definitely has kind of a, a purplish tint. It's a little cooler. There's a little bit of green in the sky actually. So I'm going to mix down now from this other blue, which is a lot closer. Adding in white. But if you only have a cool tone blue, you can do just a teeniest, teeniest touch of yellow into it and you'll get that kind of hotter color, that greener tinge to it that makes it a perfect match. I'm only mixing a small amount of color for mine because um, I'm just doing these little sections of the demo. But know that you like looking at your sky, it's going to take a lot of paint. So if you're going to be working on it, go ahead and mix enough to, to really allow yourself not to have to keep remixing to match because that can be very frustrating. So the next thing I'm going to mix for is some of these colors that you see in the tree area because we're going to do a demo of those. In acrylics we almost always work from the background to the foreground. So when you're looking at planning this I just put up the sheet that has kind of my approach, how I would attack it, in what order what techniques I might use, um, that's in the handouts section. But as a general rule of thumb, you like to work from the background to the foreground just because acrylics do cover what's behind them. That allows you to continually like get crisper in your details as you come towards the viewer. I know I have like 20 greens and all of them have white mixed into them. Very frustrating. I would not have bought the uh, multiple color set of the Arteza, I think, if I had the option to just get like more colors and larger tubes in the same price of money. But instead we have 60 colors and very tiny tubes. So for this dark background, I'm adding a little bit of green, there's a little bit of um, Payne's Gray, a touch of black, and then a pretty heavy amount of my raw umber, which is one of my darker browns. always check what it looks like in the tube versus what it like the band on the tube is they almost never match also I'm dabbing these directly onto the printout that's the best way to judge your color matching things can look really similar when they're not quite touching but as soon as they're touching you're going to be able to see it clear also always wait and see how they dry because acrylics tend to dry a little bit darker than they are when they're wet so you might have thought it was a perfect match and that dries a shade darker which can be really frustrating So I'm also going to put down a couple colors. I'm not going to worry about color matching these as much, but fill my palette ready to do the overtone for the leaves. Those sort of soft blended. There's a yellow, there's a little bit of a reddish tone, there's a green tone. My palette is super fancy. It is the uh, lid of a yogurt container. Very fancy. I realize if I mix in my Stay Wet, Stay Wet palette that I showed you last week, um, you don't get as good of a view of it from the camera, so you get this yogurt lid. So that red looks super bright when we're matching it right now, but um, I'll show you that when we're mixing into the wet background, they sort of naturally blend, so I can mix a little vibrant, knowing that it will end up kind of blurring together once I hit the canvas. All right, so we have our colors mixed here. We're gonna start actually doing some painting, woot woot. So I also wanna teach you the basics of a glazing technique, which I kind of mentioned in the previous demo, but we didn't go through. So this is a background blue that's a very similar match to the wall color of the building. Um, on the left-hand side, I'm only gonna use water to glaze with, and on the right hand, I'm gonna use glaze medium. So in order to, I, you'll see in the image, in the 
reference image that the those walls have sort of almost like a lavendery streaky mottled effect so we're going to use glazing to mimic that though we're going to go a little heavy so you can see more of it so if we're doing an h2o glaze water glaze then we want to essentially water our acrylics all the way down until they are more the watercolor consistency so i'm using a little bit of this violet and a lot of water as you can see over in the corner here then I'm going to clean off my brush because my brush is still holding the pure pigment in it. Rinse my brush off and come back and pick up just that mixed water and um, acrylic blend. And you can see it does create a nice transparent layer if you're going over an already dried layer. If you do it over a wet layer, that much water is going to like pick up the paint underneath it. Um, issue with water is it can get pretty streaky. Your pigments can get a little grainy kind of and that settles this is a canvas um, any texture the water settles into it doesn't stick so for the second glazing we're going to use this gloss glazing liquid add it straight to your paint it behaves moves and has the same consistency as a lot of your acrylic paints so it's probably thinner so when you mix them it's also going to thin your paint out so it moves more easily and as you can see it holds its shape a little better it stays where you put it um, and you can get that pigment really sheer, really thin, or you can work it up, create more opaque washes. I'm showing you that like, if your color was just a little bit off, you could use a thin layer of this to essentially tint your color, do that optical mixing that we talked about last quarter. And it's very movable, so it has a slow dry into it, so you can move this around as many times as you need. If I've gotten it too thick, I can go ahead and take a sponge and dab it up in different areas. You could do this with a rag or a paper towel too, a wet sponge. So as you can see, glazing is like a very easy technique that can be used in a lot of ways to create different color tints. You can use it to create really soft shading on stuff. It's, it's just something that works really well. If you do it with water, just know you're going to have to wait on it to dry for a long time before you can like bump anything near it. Um, but if you do happen to have medium, it can be really helpful. So the next thing we're going to work on here is the sky treatment. So we have that color that we mixed together. I'm mixing a little more of it. That ever so slightly green tinged, very bright blue with a lot of white in it, right? So when I use a brush that I want to cover a large area, I'm going to use a wide, flat brush because you're going to get the least amount of brush strokes the bigger your brush is. And you'll see me a lot. I pinch the water out of my brushes after I rinse them or after I do anything. I, t I kind of, with the grain of the bristle, pinch as much water out as possible. The more water that gets into your acrylics, the more they're going to run around on you and, and get a little muddy. So really make sure it also gets like any when you're switching colors it gets like the last amount of that color out of it there are times when you want your brush wet this is not one of them so i'm going ahead and just picking up pure white on the palette and dabbing it into this so we're doing a wet on wet blending you can see the motion of the clouds in your reference image they all sort of have a rhythm they're moving one direction they're very soft um these whites aren't pure white but i'm aware that as i dab it this kind of up and down and just slightly circular motion that I'm using is going to mix with the paint that's already on the board and create a gradient, right? So I cleaned my brush off because I was starting to just everything was blurring to the same color. I'm going to use a little bit more pure white. But when you're creating those gradients, you don't clean your brush very often because how it mixes is actually helping you. You can go back and forth, you can continue dabbing, like there's a lot of ways that you can deposit the color onto it, but we're working with a pretty heavy layer of paint on the canvas, as well as a heavy amount of paint on our brush. And then we're allowing like the friction of them meeting each other to go ahead and create mixes for us. And we're not worrying too much about cleaning off our brushes or how much texture we create. So there's also a little bit of purple in the skies in that image. So I'm using the same technique to add just what looks like a really bright violet in the palette if you dab it in and then sort of softly brush it into this wet background of the blue they mix really nicely so in order to calm down some of that texture and soften those edges and create really nice soft gradients um, I like to clean my brush pinch off all the water and then with a very 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 light touch um, just sort of 
brush it into the background, especially at the edges. And always keeping my brush moving in the same movement direction as the sky, like those clouds are going kind of at this diagonal. Or they might have kind of humps, whatever. But you're wanting your brush to move the same way that you want the final image to look like, okay? So I'm going to let that dry, let that sit as it is. We'll revisit and do like a final touch with dry brushing on it. So now we're going to do these trees. Like I said, we're going to work from the back to the front, which means we've got to lay down this dark background first. I didn't use a lot of black in my background because black's going to make a really cold mix when it works with everything. So this is like a warm, deep, dark brown um, with a little bit of a green tint to it. If you really added a lot of white to it, I think you'd get kind of like a, a grayish, greenish so it's nice to think that like when we're going to be mixing lighter colors on top of it, you want to kind of know what colors are in it and make sure that they're going to help you get there. So this has warm colors that are going to go on top of it. So if we used a pure black, Mars black, whatever, that's kind of cold, it would be harder to layer up and end up with the same like warm golden results that you're seeing in the reference image. So I've switched to a round brush because these are kind of round shapes, soft shapes. I'm going to start with a bit of yellow, just a touch of white in it, and you can see it looks super bright on my palette, but as soon as I start dabbing it into the wet background, it does disperse. So then I can keep going back to the palette, retrieving more of that pure yellow pigment and really controlling where that is in my canvas as I lay it down and allowing it to just blend into the into the dark background. Adding in some of those warmer redder hues with this Ross uh, burnt sienna. And then a touch of olive green for some of these like greenier but like uh, in the reference image even it's not a very bright tree it's not green it's got a lot of browns a lot of yellows a lot of reds it's kind of a faded, desaturated tree. So now I've got um, cleaned off my brush and coming back with just a little bit of that background color to soften some of these edges and blur them, blend them in. It's still going to mix with it a little bit and create kind of a medium between the colors that are we just added and the background that we laid down at the beginning, right? So once again, a clean filbert, and I'm laying it flat, and with that really, really soft touch over the top, very, very light, I'm going to carefully pull the colors kind of in the direction that we want them to move and soften some of the texture that I created. Sometimes I use the side of it, like I can turn it as I'm going to create a really fine point because it's a wide, flat brush, but if you angle it, right, you're going to get a little tiny line. So when I did that, I liked the texture it created, but I lost some of the warmer tones. So just going back and adding those back in. Thing about acrylics is you could spend forever. You could spend forever just sitting there and like carefully messing with them around. As long as you're moving them about, at some point they're gonna start to get tacky. Um, and pull up on you and then you're gonna have to stop but especially with acrylics I feel like I could just sit there and like re-add layers and go over things and, and continually fix things for a really long time but know that like drying time is something you are fighting so as it becomes um, if, if it starts to feel tacky if it starts to be picking up on your brush just step away just step away so doing that softening technique again adding these highlights and using the filbert to kind of push them into it and even out some of that texture. So that we're creating a smoother background. And originally this um, reference was painted in oil paints. So they had a lot more time, a lot more workability to create these soft edges. So we're kind of faking the same effect, but with acrylics. Now there does come a point in working with 
um, the wet into wet technique that you've kind of got to stop because it starts to get very muddy. So if you're starting to feel like everything's just turning to mush, sometimes it's better to, to let it dry a bit and return. And these are just about to be overworked here. I'm adding a little bit of warmth back in before we totally give up on them. You want to get, I mean, you're never going to get everything in one pass, right? The goal is not to finish your entire painting without it ever drawing. So what we're looking for here is getting a sense of movement, getting a pretty correct color guide, um, and a really nice foundation for any finishing details you want to do in your second or your third pass over this area. But it's never, it's never as easy as just doing it all at once, even though sometimes it looks like, like it could be. So taking that dark background color, once again, softening our edges, pulling out, allowing them to blend together, knowing that this will all bl dry a little darker also. And then in the reference image, there's almost a kind of like milky opaqueness to the highlights. So doing those last and letting them be a little bit more present, letting them sit on top of the paint instead of mixing them in as much. And just a little, little tiny bit of softening so we don't lose them, right? So while these are drying, we'll come back and do a little bit of a dry brushing technique demo on finishing touches on those, but we're going to go up to the top corner. Um, this has already been painted white as a base coat. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of dry brushing with and without medium to look at how you might add some of those really subtle color shifts that you see in the white walls of the houses. There's like a yellowish dirt, there's some gray modeling, this shows age on the houses that helps describe the light also in this painting. So it, when we're dry brushing you want to pick a brush that has a stiff bristle um, and something that you can kind of shove around. I like these little shorter square ones. So that's the color that's pure on the brush. I'm gonna go ahead and dab it off onto this rag and then you can very softly push color onto your canvas, onto whatever backgrounds. You can use it as a soft modeling. Um, but as you can see, it's a really nice way to get a very soft effect into a background and it's you can build it up so it's not so scary like laying down a full wet layer of paint that's going to erase all your work underneath it. It's kind of transparent. So you can see how dark that gray was, but as soon as I really dried my brush out, it gets about softer. Um, because the paint underneath is dry and what you're applying is still wet, you can pick it up also with a wet rag or a sponge and then sort of dab it off to soften edges. You can always use your local color if I wanted to make this a little lighter if this was too strong to use white to kind of soften edges of it or cover up parts of it to, to make it a watered down white like a glaze would also work well to soften it. So another method of doing essentially the same thing, you can use any brush for this, um, is to make a very translucent layer like a glaze layer like we talked about over on the other side there and you can see apply it to the canvas as very very soft translucent smudges essentially. So this is just a tiny amount of pigment held in that gloss medium being applied pretty dryly and then I'm using a dry flat brush that has no water, no medium, no anything on it to really feather it out into the background. So that's two different ways that you can achieve those sort of like worn modeled textures that you're seeing especially around the railings of the balcony. So we're going to take that dry brushing technique down here to the sky. There's a few highlights of the white that aren't popping as much from our wet blending that I'd like to put back in. So the paint in this bottom corner is still just a little bit tacky. Um, the blue is a little tacky, so as I'm adding the white, it's kind of diffusing into it by nature. It's still like a dry brushing technique, but it's a little less strong and a little bit more like painting wet. Um, so you can begin even after a short period of time. If it's not quite dry, you can still work through it and feather it out, create a nice effect on top of it. So this other corner is completely dry, so this will be more like the dry brushing we did on the white background. It creates very soft, very feathered effect on top of this. 
nice controlled way to bring some definition to those clouds and still keep that wispy motion feeling of them. If you ever do put down too much paint, so I, that white was a little strong when I put it down, I just use my brush to pull out from it without adding any more pigment and you still achieve the feathered effect. So this dark background of the trees is drying out. If you don't like working wet on wet with that background, you can also do more of um, a direct painting approach where you're mixing the colors in advance to put them on and not counting on them blending with the background as much. Either one dealer's choice. I like putting in my highlights first so that I kind of know where I'm going. It's like a map. So I've got the darkest and the lightest. Nice thing about working this way is the background's not going to pull up on you. So it was starting to pull up on me on the other side because it was still wet. And so as it gets tacky and you're working with it, it can kind of yank all the paint off with your brush. At least this way, you're not going to be um, pulling up paint as you go. That background's dried. It's attached you can kind of be more aggressive in how you lay things down. So the technique is much the same. I'm just having to be a little more conscious of the fact that they're not blending up, like, with the background and I'm not gonna get those really soft edges unless I do them myself. So I've added the warm colors. Here's a little bit of that green. Mix a bit of yellow into it. So working onto a dry background, you can get a lot more definition, which if you're going for that is really handy on these trees. It's kind of not what you want necessarily. So I'm taking a clean brush with a wet edge and working uh, to continue those kind of edges of it and pulling them out until they're translucent onto the dark background. But I'm continually cleaning my brush, adding just a touch of water and then coming back in and to do those soft effects. The paint I'm working with in this isn't as thick either, so by the time I'd added all that wet on wet blending it was pretty thick. It's going to take a while to dry. This is going to dry pretty quickly and it will be drying while I'm working on it. Because I'm not adding as much paint all at once. Small increments. I think a combination of these two would work really well if you wet blended the back or the background of the trees and added kind of blocking in of the shapes but maybe didn't go into as much color work and then you could go back through with a layer of this direct painting method and get a little bit more onto it. So this is what we end up with. You can see we got a pretty close look at the trees. They're very similar in style. The brush movements are the same. The color matching is pretty close to what we want. And you can see how using that glazing effect might come in handy for some of your other projects. Come, You can use it for a lot of different methods. If you happen to have glazing medium, you can also do it with water. It just does a little bit more work and finesse to do it with water, but it definitely works. All right.